a reason why you, I'm much better in person than I am. <laughs> Thanks, Tom. I think the recording started. <laughs> Kyle, thanks for uh, thanks for thanks for joining us. Obviously, you know you've been the the first that, that's a civilian to get the loss and the like, and you know access um, of getting there is really. I don't know if, what created the opportunity, if you will, is completely electrically powered. So it's cool. Yeah. So uh, I, I can attest to. Uh, how, how challenging it is to having a, a, a keeping a roadster running. I mean, there's a few of us on the call that are roadster owners that, that have that. Uh, you know, it, I, I, with the roof, it's a it's a thing wrong with the roof. <laughs> Specific to U.S. customers, because we've got an international audience on the on the call here. One of the things that I found was a negative that pe that may be a perception for people that first get the first power wall is the idea that you could charge your power walls on a solar connected system from the grid the way that you do your car, i.e. take advantage of time of use and charge your, your batteries on your house on the super off peak periods. In, in my case, between between 10, 8, 10 p.m. and 8 a.m. in the morning. That is not allowed because of regulations uh, regarding the credits given for solar panels for U.S. customers. So if you have solar on your system, you can only charge your batteries from the solar. That's a that's a regulatory restriction for U.S. customers. Um, technically speaking, the, the batteries could charge at any time, could go from grid or from solar. And uh, that's just one of the negatives for U.S. based people that is open to that, that is for anybody that's going to install a battery system for for your for your home. Now, if you don't have solar and you're just running strictly battery and grid, then those restrictions do not apply. But it's the moment you have solar on there that that jumps in. Um, so uh, correct me if you got any opinions on that, Kyle, but uh, that was one thing that got me when we installed ours initially in 2017 was my expectations based on Elon's presentation at Universal Studios was I could use this like my car and you know it's great that I can charge it on solar, but you know, my plan was to really get the costs down, but that that's not a, a, a able to do in the U.S. system. Right. Yeah. I think again, I think that's why why Tesla was the the, the brand we went with was because I feel like they can innovate and they will be able to dynamically adjust how the system operates as regulations change because that's a regulation issue. I think as um, the grid gets more solar added to it, there will be more incentive for for grid operators to ask. Uh, homeowners to absorb that excess grid capacity with their batteries. And so uh, I think first they'll be breaking down the wall of making it something that, that people who have solar and storage can do. But then I think, I mean, it's really a matter of software updates and, and really helping leveraging our batteries to help the grid be more stable and uh, to operate as efficiently and as low emission as possible, which those two are often synonymous, not always, but increasingly we'll see that, I think. Okay, so the, the next two questions are kind of related only because um, you know, one of the nice things about bringing Kyle on is, you know, a, as a, a senior editor for Clean Technica, he also writes articles and he's written a bunch of articles on this build that I sent to the club members for links prior to the call. So if you're a club member and didn't get it, I will resend it. If you're a guest and didn't get it, I'll, I'll resend those links as well. But the question, and you can answer them quickly, Kyle, obviously, because people are asking me here, how does the cost compare to a regular roof, which I think is a big article that you wrote on this experience. Um, and then the other question is, any pictures of the power walls and electrical setup and a rooftop shot? And that's been on the current article as well that you covered on the, uh, I think most recently on the expansion of Tesla solar, uh, Tesla roof all around the country. So, um, you know, if you want to put in chat the, the links as well, if you've got it readily available, that's fine. But those sure. are- Yeah, I'll drop, yeah. I'll drop those in in a minute. Um, in terms of the, the cost, I mean, for us, uh, because it was a new build, I mean, our, our financials were were different because we were comparing the cost of a, a roof and we were looking at a metal roof, which is already a fairly expensive roof. Uh, but I had actual quotes from five installers, uh, which netted out to 30, just under 38,000. Uh, and then to add solar to that was another 38,000. And so for us, uh, I was really looking at the cost of um comparing a metal roof to buying power uh, to the solar system, uh, the integrated solar system with the solar roof. And so basically, instead of installing a metal roof and buying power, um, we saved 
um, almost $50,000, a little more than $50,000 over the life of the system uh, by installing that. And that's kind of the base use case for solar, but I think with the, the solar roof, um, it was definitely more expensive. Um, so before rebates, the system would have cost around $70,000. And I'll drop these links into the chat in a minute. Um, but uh, for us, it was a significant cost savings. Um, it wasn't fully driven by the rebates. I mean, even without the solar uh, production tax credit, um, which we'll get this year, just based on when they actually commissioned the system, um, it would have been a, a good option um, versus not installing solar. Uh, if you compare it to a traditional solar system, um, it was right around parity. I think it was maybe within uh, three or four thousand uh, dollars for that. I didn't write an article about so comparing the, the Tesla solar roof to a traditional solar system because I felt like version two um, was already it was it was just a stepping stone on to where they were going. So version three is really the one to compare to uh, traditional solar and from everything we've seen, I mean it it, it just blows it away uh, when you compare the cost of a traditional roof and installing solar to the, the Tesla solar roof. And that makes sense in a lot of ways. I mean, now that they've optimized a lot of the installation and, and building manufacturing of the, the panels themselves, um, it, it's something that just makes a lot of sense to do all, all at once versus doing it in two steps. I have to unmute myself on a different, whoa. <laughs> There you go. Sorry, I had, I had to mute myself because my image kept popping up, at least on my system, uh, when you were talking. So I didn't know whether it was messing with the recording or anything. Um, OK, the next question is from, uh, looks like it's from Tom, about the efficiency. And I think that was answered on your, correct me if I'm wrong, but with, with version two, my understanding is the efficiency of the, of the a roof isn't as efficient as if you had put in solar panels at the time. Do you happen to know if it's the same way with version three? I haven't heard anything about the efficiency of version three. Version two, I think our panels were 18.8%. Uh, that was based on my calculations of system production, but also kind of what I had heard from, from Tesla. Um, and I, I don't know what that is for version three. If you compare that to traditional panels, we were looking at uh, 1920 uh, sun power panels are upwards of 22 or 23 percent um, with kind of their higher end panels. So it's definitely less efficient, but you're installing it in place of something else. So yeah, was, we were willing to absorb that. Okay, so first, uh, my question we have will be from Andrew. I'm going to unmute. Andrew, you've got the question. Hello, everybody, and good afternoon. Thanks for bringing uh, me up, Dennis. Uh, just a quick background. I'm currently just past design phase for a V3 solar roof on our new construction. Um, and uh, what I've seen in the pricing so far between a concrete tile roof and solar panels at about 17.2 kilowatts and the solar roof at 17.2 kilowatts, it's, uh, we're at about a $12,000 difference. But my question to you, um, Kyle, was, I'm having a lot of trouble getting my builder on board. Did you have any conversations with your builder in regards to that? And were they ha did they have any hesitation? Uh, our builder was excited about it. I think for us, there was a little bit of um, anticipation of being one of the first new construction homes with the Tesla solar roof on there. Um, and he was excited about that possibility and being able to kind of promote himself with that. Uh, but I mean, I, I think if I were in your shoes, I mean, you're the customer, I, I would just, Try to force it with him. I mean, it's like you're you're the one paying him to do the job you want to do. Uh, that doesn't always go smoothly, but you could also try to pull Tesla in on that discussion. Uh, I mean, it wasn't really any different than working with a typical roof installer, other than the fact that I picked Tesla instead of my contractor going out and finding a roofer. Uh, but yeah, we didn't have any issues with that. It was actually a, a seamless process in terms of the integration into our overall construction schedule. All Thank good, you. Andrew? Yeah, I'm good, thank you. All right, next question is uh, with Dean. Dean, go ahead. Hello, uh, thank you for your uh, your insight so far. I'm finding this really helpful. I'm, I'm actually working on a, an eco houses project uh, here in the UK at the moment. And 
a question that I've got for you is um, I'm, I'm really you know impressed that you've managed to go for the maximum capacity as a percentage do you, do you know what percentage of the roof you were you were able to cover with active tiles and I and don't also... but I can oh sorry oh sorry I, I was also going to ask uh, do you know the the percentage efficiency in terms of like for example I've just bought some solar panels that are 340 watts um and they cover an area of 1.7 square meters each so you can work out the the watts per square meter of active right. area I'm just intrigued to kind of I'm a bit of a numbers geek so um I'm intrigued to figure uh, I'm, I'm also a, an early adopter reservation holder in the UK for the solar tiles and I'm hoping to, that we build with uh, solar tiles so excellent yeah very interesting um around 2,000 square feet I can get you an exact number from the drawings uh, but I don't have that oh, off the top okay. of my head Fantastic. percentage that was covered by the tiles um so a bit of a letdown there uh but I, I can go find think about it you're slicing kind of a trapezoidal uh roof into little rectangles um uh, just mm -hmm. by design there's a bit of inefficiency relative to a perfectly out uh, panel too. So our roof um, has a significantly less uh, than you would get from a version three, you get more production because then you're not concerned about um, all the gaps between them, you know, the top, the panels on there. Gotten, I know we could have gotten more production if we would have gone with like a sun power panel, just saying, does the roof was enough for us? Um, and then the fact that it was seamlessly integrated and in uh, that was just like with Dennis and get you that afterwards for the, uh, the actual layout and the actual number of so next question, or I guess a comment from James. James, you have a work on the chart, charting the batteries from off-grid. Found what your statement there, um, Dennis, about not being able to charge it from the grid. If you have enough solar, I found a workaround where you can uh, divert all the solar to the power walls, use the grid at cheap power to, to sustain the house where you direct everything you can to the power walls. And then by the time two, three o'clock runs around, you got full power walls, you're selling to the grid, and then you can run off your power walls all night, no issue. So, but you do need enough solar energy, of course, to, to be able to do that and fill the power walls up fast enough. But yeah, it works really well to buy that uh, regulatory hurdle you got to get around. Yeah, you know what? I, I, I do that with, uh, with, with an oversized power wall set up, uh, you know, just to give the, the, the participants and any future recording callers an idea. Uh, of your profiles of what our systems are like. I have a system that tops off at 40 kilowatt hours. It's a 6.58 DC system. Uh, so it's undersized for the fact that I have three power walls. And James, you have four power walls and how big is your system? <laughs> uh, four power walls and 36 panels at 11.34 kilowatts. Yeah, so you know, the generation is different between ours for me, it takes two days to fully fill up, you know, in general with usage of the house and like to fully fill up the batteries because I had, when I, when I ordered in 20, whatever, and got it delivered in 2017, uh, they weren't up front. Tesla wasn't quite up front because the guys didn't know that we're installing it. Um, as is the case with Tesla for those long time folks, you know, a lot of times, a lot of the innovation happens, but it doesn't necessarily trickle down to what the person that's installing the unit at your house knows. Um, and they they didn't understand why it was charging only from the solar the whole time and it took two full days of peak production in the summer for me um in 2017 to fill the battery up before i could you know do anything with it and i forced it to backup mode at that time to fill it up um so those are the sort of things that that, that are workaround so so on the weekends for example because un under um oh that's one of the questions i was i, I was emailed was if it, i don't know kyle and i I think James, you you would know because you just got yours installed. But aside from federal credits on solar, um, are there any other incentives for battery and solar? And I I, I think we have Phil on, on on the line as well, and Phil knows quite a bit more about this than than I do. I mean, what, what I told the, the our uh, member was, I know the federal is big. My understanding is there is a new set of S GIPS, which is for self generation incentive program for batteries to take care of the public safety power shutoffs for high risk areas because the utility can't build it fast enough and they're gonna to need to shut power off because of fire danger. Um, you know, aside from that, what's available to a new install in California? Um, so this is a very California specific question. 
you know, you guys aware of anything else or James, since you just installed, have you applied for anything else or putting, putting out a cypher to throw something or, or Phil, if you want to jump in. Yeah. Do here. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Um, the, the one that you referred to was for the fire prone areas where they're doing public safety shutdowns and they're doing a uh, huge uh, uh, SGIPs for that will almost pay for your battery completely if you're in the mm -hmm. fire prone have experienced shutdowns. The one that I am involved in, which is not, I'm not in a fire prone area. I'm in a, I'm in Irvine in the middle of a sub suburb is a um, program that uh, Edison is uh, working with the Public Utilities Commission, and they're trying to see if distributed storage uh, in residential homes can alleviate the need to build a peaker power plant for, for the utility. And so what they're doing is um, recruiting homeowners with solar or trying to add, add solar and batteries to um, uh, uh, have, have a program where in a certain region where they were going to build a peaker plant anyway, don't build the plant, but put these batteries out in the community. And then when there's a, uh, the agreement is apparently when there's going to be a, uh, a peak demand like there is now, uh, rather than force our batteries to push power back to the grid, which is a, what I thought they were going to do, they're just going to make sure that our batteries are feeding our homes. Well, that's what we're going to do anyway. Um, during peak demand, we're going to try and and uh, power our homes for our batteries anyway, so it's no big deal. And uh, they um, they give a small discount of about a thousand or fifteen hundred off the battery, and um, twenty they they suddenly got access to the latest round of SGIP, which is twenty nine hundred dollars per battery. Um, so uh, for a fourteen thousand dollar installation of one power wall, I'm getting, uh, uh, I'm after uh, federal tax credit and the SGIP and discounts, I'm going to pay, pay about 7,500. Okay. Thanks, Phil. Yep. James, anything on your end or Kyle? Nothing on my end, no. Okay. Oh, I think you covered it well. What about you, Kyle? Um, you 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 kind of would have uh, would have gotten that 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 public shutoff thing had they <laughs> offered it the time you were installing, right? That could have helped make your numbers better. Yeah, yeah, we are in a little bit of a fire-prone area, given that we, we just lost our house. We're actually we our neighborhood sticks out into the hills, so it is a little more fire-prone up here. But uh, yeah, I, I don't think we we're eligible for those rebates, but uh, they do look attractive now that they've got those in effect. So. Quick, quick question since you are in that area, and before we get to the next question on the thing, you know, uh, I guess moderator's prerogative. So you built this house now that's fully electric and everything. I'm sure that some of your neighbors came back and are building, and some may have sold to new neighbors, so you may have some new neighbors in the neighborhood. Um, has anyone else followed your lead to just get rid of, to figure, you know what, we're in a fire prone area, probably not a good idea to have natural gas running right by me. Um, kind of thing. Has anyone else gone all electric like you have in your neighborhood that you know of? No, no, I think it's still, it's still, I wouldn't say a novelty, but it's, it's definitely not the norm here. I think people like, they're just, they're just used to natural gas and they just kind of say as, as it was, that's what I want in the future. Um, I think the biggest thing I've heard is that cooking is a big incentive for people. They like cooking over a gas, uh, flame, which is just, it's so ironic to me when we did a kind of a home assessment, an energy assessment, maybe five years ago. And they found that the biggest source of like indoor air pollution in our house was the the gas stove, and it wasn't from the methane or anything, but it was the combustion. And it's just it's it's I think you you grow up getting used to this and, and cooking around natural gas, but when you start thinking about it, you're like we're burning things inside our house, and then we're breathing those fumes in without really taking into account into account the ventilation. So I think people just aren't educated about about the indoor air pollution and indoor air quality um, as the primary motivator for it and then i think climate change and energy savings and all that is uh our secondary factors but indoor air quality is uh is a much larger issue than people really take give it credit for but okay. we haven't seen a, a carry-on effect with that much in our neighborhood some folks are installing solar but we haven't we haven't heard of anyone else going uh, fully electric yeah no that's uh that, that is that, that is novel and hopefully more people do that um 
So the next question is a comment as well uh, from Jason. Uh, Jason, I don't know if you're still with us, but there, there've been some activity on chat as well answering it. And Greg had shared that the version three is 60 watts per tile for anybody. Has joined. Oh, somebody else has rejoined, I guess. Um, so he wants to know whether te Tesla took any consideration on your loads, I think is what it, what it looks like. And you know, my, my understanding on the way Tesla is selling the systems now is the small, medium, large uh, concept. And they're trying to make it so that it's off a menu rather than, and then maybe cut it down to size uh, to what's, what's in there. Correct me if I'm wrong. I mean, James, you're the one that's been, it's actually just gone through that whole process uh, sooner than the rest of us have, and yours is all Tesla. So is that a proper assessment? Is that you really told them this is what I want and they just made it fit in your roof? Or do they do an assessment like the way Jason's asking and saying it's gonna be double the size of his home and planning on putting a pool. So wants to make sure that the lows are covered in a more uh, direct manner. Yeah, so for us, it is exactly that. Small, medium, large, extra large. Um, for us, uh, extra large wouldn't fit on the roof. We didn't have enough square footage. So we went with the large and we, we just bought the house. So we didn't have 12 months of history. So we just told them we have two, two electric vehicles, uh, the square footage of our house. And they said, yeah, large, good. And uh, that's how they decided on our load. We did mention we might want to put a pool in the future. Um, and they said, that's no problem when you go to do that. Just, you know, any electrician can look at the load profile and figure out if it will fit on your power wall or not. Um, a good rule of thumb for those that don't know is every power wall can withstand 30 amps of continuous draw. So we have four power walls. That's why we went with four. We could do 120 amps of continuous draw. So it was able to cover the entire home. If you only do two, you can't do your entire house because it's only 60 amps. So when you have two cars, you can't, two Teslas, you can't be pulling everything off those power walls. That's kind of how you can figure it out in the future and uh, ensure that you your your pool, if you want it to be, can be on the power walls as well. Okay. Thanks, James. And then, Kyle, for you, you, you had a history with your old end phase system. Uh, so you knew what your load was before you went all electric, and then you just added some stuff on top of it, right? I mean... Yeah, I mean, it was it was completely bottom up because we we basically redid everything in the house. We we were not fully electric before, so we had gas appliances, gas dryer, and things like that. Um, actually, the dryer we converted, so we had an electric one at the end there. Um, but because it was all electric and it was all new, we basically just kind of calculated it. Um, and I, I really wanted to max it out anyway because I, I knew that we were going to be consuming. Uh, a significant amount of power from from the system or just from that the grid if, if we didn't have it covered with solar and so we did have to calculate it. i think as an edison requirement uh more than tesla but tesla did kind of ask for that and help us with that um, along the way uh, but just kind of putting in the appliances you have uh the electric cars you have like james mentioned um and uh confirming that the the solar system was at least uh within the the, the realm of what you were going to use and not just uh, result in uh, copious excess uh, generation from your house. I, I have a comment. Um, we, uh, we, we, our, our solar system was installed 13 years ago. Uh, it was a 5.2 kilowatt system. And uh, we've been running, basically paying no electric bill with the, the uh, Edison time of use uh, programs like most of you are familiar with. Um, and then I started looking ahead at the new uh, tariffs that are being going to be forced on us coming forward where the peak times are in the evening. And I did the math and I said, you know, my my and even Edison's uh, com rate comparison tool said I was going to go from pretty much zero bill to a thousand dollars a year with my current system. So I figured out needed. So I added a second solar system um, and completely uh, you know, uh, on a, just a separate system from the first one. And uh, I used two okay. years yeah, ago. At least we had to start ordering in the middle of the week, I think. Holy shit. <laughs> our electric cars a lot and using a lot of air conditioning because 2018 was a really hot summer. We used K kilowatt hours for the year. So he said, oh, that's fine. Well, when I got around to I'm from Edison, they said, oh, you're, you know, this system's oversized for your needs based on last year. 
uh, you have to sign something that says that you expect, to, uh, you're aware of this and you expect to make this, uh, you know, uh, that the, the system that you're installing will be going forward. And so I, I got to make sure that I'm gener I'm using more than I'm, uh, I'm right in the middle of a pandemic when we're hardly driving. Right. Um, so it was a shock to me because, hey, we had a history of just two years ago using more than we're going to generate. Yeah, I think James made I, a note on chat about, you know, what, what before and exactly what you had. And James said that he, since he didn't have a history of it and they estimated what it was, he had to sign, uh, with, you know, he's also with Edison. So a lot of us are with the same utility here. So it's very Edison focused. Uh, had, to, had to sign something with him that says that he would consume what is produced. So, you know, it's uh, it's interesting though. I mean, I, I, my goal has always been to, to, to pay 20 bucks at the end of the year, because uh, I'm doing the net metering. I'm always undersized. House isn't yeah. big enough for me to put a huge array back there. And, you know, unfortunately, even at 60 watts of tile, if we change the entire roof to, to version three solar, I'm probably not going to add that much more production on it, though it would be pretty darn cool. So, I don't know. You guys know me. I, 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 I tend to be a I tend to be a Tesla fan. So, you know, <laughs> I never say never. And the problem with the solar tile is it's aesthetically pleasing. And you guys all know Carolyn and, uh, you know, she's the reason why we have good taste, not me. So <laughs> that, that's going to be have to be how that goes. But we'll, we'll see, man. I mean, uh, OK, next next question. OK, so that was that. And Alan gave us his email for people that may want to give him uh, experience. So those of you guys that are here that have a chat, and if you've got things you can share with them, please do that. Um, so a question from Dean. Dean, you had a question on uh, standing charge costs, initial installation costs by opting not to have natural gas. Could, you know, do you see that? Then yeah, there? I do, I do, yeah. Um, our our contractor did take that into account. Um, I mean, you're offsetting a, I guess I would say a lower natural gas bill, but a lower plumbing bill um, because the plumber didn't have to install that piping. Uh, there was no interconnection charge. Um, and you're offsetting that with a, a larger electrical system because it was a new build. Uh, we did have a direct, it wasn't direct one for one offset, but our, our electrical was probably uh, 10,000 more than it would have been because we had a 400 amp system. And not all of that is, is due to the uh, the fact that the home is fully electric. I mean, we have two electric cars, which, which adds to that. And we, we wanted to overbuild because it, it's way cheaper to do it during construction. So I'd say our, our electrical was probably five or 10,000 more than it would have been um, if we would have had gas infrastructure for some of the, the usual suspects in the house. And then on the gas side, on the plumbing side, um, it was a, an $8,000 charge just to get everything kind of wired up to the house or plumbed up to the house. Um, and then um, some additional infrastructure in the house. So I think the installation, it would have been about 12,000 for the gas portion of the build. Uh, and then ongoing, I mean, our gas bill was very, very low. Um, I'd say typically between uh, maybe $10 a month up to 30 or $40 a month um, when we were using quite a bit of stuff. So uh, I would say the ongoing charges and savings probably don't pay out. I think we would, we're paying more or generating more in electricity um, in terms of the financials than, than we're saving in gas. Uh, but because it's solar, um, that helps take the edge off of that. But all, even on the installation, I mean, we were we did save quite a few thousand dollars just by eliminating the gas and going with the fully electric home. Yeah, a lot of that really depends on what you're paying for natural gas and what the production is. and and you know, Dean, when you start go going cross border, it doesn't translate as well because, you know, a lot of these things are subsidized in your taxes somehow and it's kind of hidden, right? So don't know what the what the cost is with, uh, what is it, national gas? Is that what you guys call it? National national grid? Right? What is it? National something for you guys in, in the UK for, for, the, for the gas heating and stuff. But uh, that's why it's a utility. Um, Jason asks, can you add... Always, can you always add more solar after install? Additionally, will the power wall help with time of use when it is the hottest part of the day and AC will be used? Um, I think that's part of what your answer was uh, er, earlier um, on, on the, in, 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 in terms of using up the, uh, the all the uh, charging the batteries all the way up to full and then, and then running it. I think it's the opposite of that. 
I mean, it's what I do at two o'clock. At two o'clock, they're the current version of the software. I mean, I've I've been on Powerwalls for a while now, and and I've seen different iterations of it. But the current iteration of the software, I don't know, Kyle, if you got it in front of you, so you can show the screen that does the setup to advanced time of use and all that stuff. Because since my screen is off. Um, so the current version of the software allows you to configure your tariff or shadow it on there so that you can use your batteries rather than the grid and vice versa. So Kyle, why don't you talk to people see your screen? Yeah, so in terms of the, uh, the power all operation, I mean, you can configure it differently based on the current software. Uh, for us, we've got it to maximize our self-generation. Um, it just feels like the most responsible way to use it for us. Um, our power walls typically fill up um, in COVID times where we're not charging two electric cars fully. Um, they typically fill up around noon or one o'clock. Uh, and then at that point, it, it starts passing it back to the power back to the grid by default. Um, so a lot of times if we do need to charge the car, or we, I'll wait till then. I could program it in to have it start that way, but it's just not something we do very often because we drive uh, my Tesla very infrequently right now. Um, in terms of the, the first part of your question, Jason, about adding more solar, um, the solar roof itself, uh, because we maxed that out, uh, it has as much solar generation as, as they could possibly fit on our roof structure. Um, if you didn't do that, I would not expect that Tesla would come back and retrofit it. I think um, you could always add panels as kind of a standalone array um, on a different part of the property as like a shade unit. Or something like that but um, i think in terms of adding it to the roof i, I think that's that's off the table um, whether it be through additional solar roof tiles integrated or um, traditional panels um, one thing about our system that is unique is that we because we did maximize the solar coverage we have tiles on the north side of our roof that are supposed to produce power and so um, tesla actually came out and looked at it because they were confused why one of the inverters wasn't producing as much power as as it, it normally would. And it turned out that it was just because they were on the north side of the roof. So they really had to go back and look at their calculations because it is such an oddball way of doing it, um, putting panels on the north side of the roof, which they almost never do. But they said it was generating about 70%, 70% of what they were they would have expected from a normal array. So that was interesting, something that I don't think most people will experience. So just, just, I'm gonna just, take out, before we get take Kelvin's question on the additional power wall, I'm going to take moderator's prerogative based on that, and understanding that I'm running um, I, I'm running end phase as well at the house. So I, you know, part of what I like about that is like I'm able to see the production on each panel, um, and understanding that Tesla's building this solar uh, solar roof product. Do they have so, a similar capability where they can go all the way down to the the, the tile level or do they just see it in a system of how do they notice that there was under production going on in the north side of your house? Well, or really what the north side is producing is what it was. Right. Um, our particular system doesn't have a lot of uh, intelligence built into it. So in terms of the, the major pieces of the puzzle, you've got obviously the solar roof tiles. In version two, those packs of three, which you can see back here behind me, um, each brick of three tiles produces 25 watts. So comparing to version three at 60 watts, it's a, it's a significant increase. There, the version three tiles are a bit larger, um, but um, basically those tiles produce power. They all string together with typical solar wiring connectors. There's nothing uh, proprietary about that. Those um, go to, I think what is normal now, a set of um, rapid shutdown devices. They're, ours are made by Delta. Um, and those basically will shut off each of those micro arrays um, in the event of a power failure or some sort of issue with the system. And that's a, a part of code that's required here in California and maybe in the US. Um, those rapid shutdown devices all go to a single uh, brick and they, they block those out by uh, inverter. So they kind of funnel each of those microgrids down to a, a common area and then wire them all back to uh, the central inverter. For us, our 10.6 kilowatt system has two five kilowatt inverters. Uh, they're Delta as well, and nothing along that chain is, to my knowledge, intelligent or connected. I think they do see it um, kind of at the gateway based on what comes out of those inverters, but I don't think the inverters themselves are connected or intelligent um, in terms of how they tie into the Tesla system. So 
they really just see the two feeds. I'm getting five kilowatts here and four kilowatts here or something along those lines. Um, like I said earlier, I think inverter technology, uh, I like Solar Edge, but they're really pushing the limits on what's possible in terms of connectivity and actual like home energy management, which I feel is kind of where we're going with solar storage and, and really just being more efficient about how we use our power in the home. Thanks, Tom. So the question that I skipped for, going back to is Kelvin's question and I thought I saw some hand raises the same guys from earlier. And um, if you guys really are, have raised your hands, please unmute and speak up. But before we do that, uh, Kelvin's question was, can you add an additional power wall afterwards? And I think you're at two right now. So do you foresee yourself, um, did you leave yourself room to add another one or two or three or, or what? I mean, what's uh, <laughs> What's the plan yeah, I think I think based on using the system um, and seeing that the power walls are filling up, the two that we have are filling up just after noon. Uh, I think there's a little bit of additional value to be added um, in installing a third um, or even potentially a fourth. Uh, I, th I think a lot of that really depends on how much regulations change in the future or how much we really feel like we need to be self-reliant. Um, in terms of the current wiring, we have those two power walls backing up a 200 amp sub panel, which has one of our three. EV charger um, circuits on it, um, and that's that's enough for us. I mean, in terms of our basic function, in, in even in an emergency, we could go for weeks, if not longer, without an additional power wall. But um, we could, and I think most owners can, as long as they have room in their panel, um, add more power walls. Um, we have room in our panel; they're very close to to that renewable sub panel that they wired in, and I, I don't think that would be an issue at all. Yeah, and there was a there was a comment regarding offering a significant discount if you install the third one right up front. Um, yeah, that's been my experience is different because mine's so early. But for us, we were trying to catch the SGIP, and right. we actually got it as a commercial install on the third tranche because uh, the utilities see more than two power walls as being a commercial install, not, not a residential. So uh, we did get some help from, um, from the state, but the requirements are, if you get that SGIP credit, you have to use your battery capacity over 52, you know, 52 times your battery capacity over the year. So, I mean, basically right. you have to cycle your battery's uh, energy once a, once a week, um, which is easy to do. I mean, like, I mean, I've got mine going down to 50% every day and, you know, yeah, are, are pretty good. Um, but yeah, let me look at the chat. Ooh, so that was a question that, yeah, and as far as additional power wall, I mean, if you're planning on, on future growth, that's an installation. You install yours in the garage. I know that James installed his in the garage. And I mean, for us, when we did our install, um, I installed ours on the side of the house because my visual was the party at Universal City where they had it installed at the side of the house on a concrete <laughs> slab. So that's the way I had it. Um, uh, regretting it now, because it's like, it looks so nice when you guys have it on the side of the house or, or <laughs> inside the garage. So, um, but I do have room to go up to, to, to another three more on top of my three that are there <laughs> on the concrete slab I put in though. I don't have enough generation to do that. But uh, all right, I think that's the uh, last of our questions. We, we've hit two o'clock uh, 13 minutes ago. So I don't know, Kyle, if you've got more time or if people have any more questions, anything else you want to share. We've got some guys that had their hands raised, but it's the same guys that had their hands raised earlier. So if you really have your hand raised, please unmute and ask your question. Andrew, are you, yeah, are you good? Yeah, yeah. yeah, I got a question. Um, as it comes to service on the, the solar roof, have you had any issues where they had to come out how did that work out? Did they have to replace any um, items or anything like that? Uh, we haven't had any service issues yet. I mean, for anybody that's had solar, as, as you guys know, I mean, it, it's a very low maintenance, even lower maintenance than electric cars um, system typically. Uh, our end phase system, we had a, a microinverter fail and, and they came out and installed that. That was a Sunrun system. Uh, but we have not had any issues at all with our, our solar roof. Um, the one service engagement that we had, which wasn't, it was part of the installation, it wasn't a part of service, was the post-installation check where they came and changed out five tiles. Um, but no, I haven't had any uh, any service issues yet or even any service needed yet, so. 
Yeah, I, I, have a, I have an eight-year-old Enphase system for the solar, and I've had microinverters go out. Mm -hmm. um, funny enough, I, I did it as a prepaid lease because I thought I'd get the lessor uh, or less, yeah, the lessor on the hook to maintain it for me, only to have the company that was leasing it to me go under a year ago. So um, they did revert ownership and title to the system to me. So now oh, I am responsible to have it maintained, find find people when I need to and pay people to repair it. The, the, the microinverters are still under warranty. So that gets sent out to me. And then I just pay someone to go up there and install it because um, I'm a klutz on regular ground. You won't find me on the <laughs> roof. I went up on my roof once because I don't have a drone to, to fly up there and take a photo of it. And that was when I was much younger than I am now. So, you know, at least eight years ago. So that's uh, uh, that's the way that is. But well, what did it cost you to pay somebody to go and replace them? So the average cost in Orange County was about 200 bucks for someone hmm. to roll a truck to go out. I found some guys in Anaheim that were doing it for 100 to, to come out or 125, I think is what they were charging. Uh, so I, I quickly jumped on them, scheduled them, they came out. It all happened during COVID and they did it. Um, you know, I've left the inverter outside. They took care of uh, the disposal, the e-waste disposal. Um, I have an older end phase microinverter. So they used to ask us to mail those back, but I guess they went to a new next gen. And so they just, they, they took it with them and they'll, they'll, they've got their own means of electronic disposal. Like, I don't want to put it in the landfill or anything, so I have to have that taken care of properly, and they did, they did that. So I'm pretty happy with them. They're called Advanced Improvement, I think is the name of the people that I, that I use for anybody that, that has you know, third-party solar. Um, but my, you know, my power falls are obviously straight from Tesla. I have a friend that's just about to put in a new system with Enphase. Is that, do you think that's a good idea these days with the state of the art? Um, I think their, their later microinverters are supposed to be better. I mean, I've had three replacements, two of which were under warranty, and then the first one that was under warranty, that was out the where the actual labor was out of warranty was just recent. So uh, the, the product themselves are still under warranty, so they're, they're fine. The warranty periods are a lot, much longer, which tells you that their technology is probably better. I mean, I think it's like a 25-year warranty now for the microinverters. Yeah, he said that. Yeah, they're I mean, pretty low find, cost. I mean... Oh, go ahead, James. Uh, well, the question was for you, Kyle, actually. You, you've got experience with both end phase inverters with the micro and everything. And then with Tesla, it's, it's all string inverter. They have one or two inverters for the, for the system. Oh, we've got two. Um, I think the benefit of end phase is that it's a, it's a very small product. I mean, they're, I don't know, the size of a tablet. Um, and they, they bolt up and they wire up very easily. So I think for DIY folks, they're fairly easy to change out. But um, they kind of go together. I mean, with, with those uh, onboard uh, lower cost inverters, I think you tend to see more failures. Uh, Dennis had three. I've had one or had one on our, our old system in the, the six years that we had it or seven years that we had it running. Um, but I, I like the idea of the, the central string inverter because it, um, I feel like they're built a little more with a little more durability in, in mind. I mean, you're paying several thousand per inverter. Um, so they are a little more durable and robust um, in my experience. But obviously, I mean, I don't have a lot of experience with these inverters. I just uh, I like the idea, but I think they're less prone to failure. And uh, just one less thing you have to worry about. Um, I mean, there's no there's no real benefit to, uh, I don't know. If they're going to fail, it's it's it just it impacts the system. It's one more thing to go do. And so I'd rather not have that for, for me or for other folks. Excellent. So one one question is on here, and I mean, we're past time. So Kyle, thanks for sticking around. I think we'll probably wind us down. But the last question that I have here is, do the power walls take a hit in performance if mounted outside during the winter or summer for extreme temps? Um, mine's been outdoors uh, for three years, uh, and it seems to be performing OK. But yours is indoors. So obviously, you've got that, that experience. And none of us get winter. Uh, really out here. So, you know, maybe the, uh, I would ask somebody who actually has winter experience that's out outdoors to see whether that, that there's a big difference. But my understanding is these are also liquid cooled. Am I, am I wrong in assuming that or? No, I think they are, they're actively cooled. Um, I, I think the, 
the performance hit that I would expect is, is similar to what we see with the cars, right? I mean, in extreme cold or extreme hot uh, temperatures, I mean, you're going to have lower efficiency. Uh, you're going to get less power from it, less range in a car. And I think you'd expect the same with the, with the power wall. Um, so I think in, in extreme temperatures, I'd expect that they would be biased towards indoor or garage installs where you're, you're a little more insulated from the, uh, the elements. Excellent. Well, I think, uh, I, I think we're out of questions on the chat and we've, we've gone over quite, quite a bit of time. Thank, Kyle, thanks, thanks so much for joining us. I'm looking forward to the day that you and I can, uh, can test out a Raven and play video games <laughs> on the freeway. You know, that's, <laughs> that was a, quite a fun trip, but, uh, or, or just hanging out at, a, at an event, man. I mean, but thank you for, totally. for being, being our, our revolutionary for this, uh, for this Sunday and everyone else that's participated. Um, thanks, James, and, and thanks, Phil, for your, for your solar system uh, sharing as well. And hope those of you that, uh, that had your questions, if you got any further questions or want to get a hold of Kyle, uh, this is one of the things that, that, I had, that I had to learn from, from having Eli on the first time, and he had to throw his socials and all that stuff out there. Do you want to share how people can get a hold of you, Kyle? Yeah, I think Twitter's the best. I mean, uh, it's, it's public. It's all out there, and you can, you can direct message me on there. Uh, that's, that's just the easiest way to get a hold of me. We can jump to email if that's easier for you. But uh, I really appreciate you guys having me on here. I mean, it's, it's a blast to get on here and just chat about the stuff that we're passionate about. I mean, I'm not just somebody that covers this. This is something I, I love. I'm, I'm with you guys. I've spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on Tesla products over the years, and uh, I love sitting down and chatting about it. So I really appreciate the time and, and all the good questions. So thanks, guys. Yeah, so for those that don't have Kyle's social, it's at Mr. Kyle Field. So, <laughs> so you and I aren't good Thank at promoting you. ourselves. <laughs> yeah, so, yep, no, forget that. Yep, appreciate it. <laughs> yeah. So that's his Twitter. Um, if you don't follow him already, and obviously at Clean Technica uh, is the is the site that he writes for and edits for. Um, and uh, you know, if, if you need me to pass along your information, you've got mine because you all got invites to this. And uh, thanks again. Have, have a good Sunday, man, and uh, keep cool. Yeah, he was wrong. Thanks again, guys. Thanks. You're recording, right, Dennis? Yeah, it's, I'm recording. So it, the stream stopped or had an error, but I will upload the recording. Okay, cool. All right. Recording, recording. paused. There, see, now it stopped. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Thanks. Awesome. Thanks. Review. down to nine <laughs> if i'm gonna try to see if i can turn the, the video back on since uh see, that's weird all right so once i'm kicked off i can't redo the video so mark oh. thanks for hanging up your video but that didn't help me any hey uh, dennis you still there all right i'm back on audio on this one thanks everyone i have a quick question since there's just a couple of us